بسم الله والحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأغضة من لساني يبقى قولي Assalamu alaikum, uh, my younger brothers. Uh, so this is our third lesson. We start with uh, today with Surah Baqarah, inshallah. We will be focusing on ayah number one to five. And uh, and uh, let's start with the, with the introduction immediately. Okay, so I just want you to remember um, four points about this surah. Again, I mean, there are many uh, points and uh, many discussions that can happen. It's a, it's a very vast and uh, surah with a lot of depth in it. But the key points, number one, the, uh, the name of the surah, Bakara, it means cow. So technically, if you translate it literally, it means cow. And this, uh, there's a subject matter around the cow, um, which is mentioned in ayah from 67 to 73. Now, this doesn't mean that this is the only topic that was discussed, but this is how the surah has been named. There are multiple topics, as we will see as we go through um, reading and understanding the surah, that there are multiple topics that are um, covered in this surah. This is the largest surah in the Holy Quran. It has 286 ayahs. Okay, so this is one of the largest uh, surahs that we have. This surah starts the answer to the prayer that we made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous surah fatiha if you recall in that prayer in that surah we the meanings that we understood is that we were first we thanked and praised allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, we understood he is rabbul alameen um, and then you know we asked for guidance and his guidance on what is the right path so that he shows us the right path and then uh, save us from the path of those who go astray and astray the meaning one of you asked basically it's the path of the wrongdoers who are on the wrong path so we always pray for Allah Ta'ala for the guidance now this was the opening of the Quran Surah Fatiha now we are moving to the answer which is the entire Holy Quran and we will see that it starts um, with the initial ayahs that we will uh, we will inshallah try to understand today from one to five um, on who are the people who are on the right path and what do we need to do to be uh, amongst those people inshallah. Um, this entire surah was uh, revealed in Medina. Um, so if you remember last time we also discussed that there were two parts of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prophethood. So initially for the first 10 years he spent his time in Mecca and then he migrated with his companions towards Medina. And uh, here, basically, he established the Islamic state. And for uh, a Islamic state, or let's say we can call it in these days, we call it like a country, um, you need to have some laws regarding the social, economic, legal, all of these things uh, that we have to run a state or to run a country. Because previously in the first 10 years, he talked about the fundamentals of Islam, uh, faith, um, and now we will see as we go through this surah, as I told you, it's the largest surah in the Holy Quran. We will see different topics that come up with the collective life of people or the, or the social life that we spend all together, uh, like in a country or in a state. So this surah will also deal with those elements. So let's start. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. We seek protection from Allah, from the accursed shaitan, because obviously we are trying to get guidance and uh, he is the one who, who tries to prevent us from, from getting guidance. So we seek Allah's protection, uh, that he protects us from uh, shaitan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. These three letters are one of the miracles of Quran. And you will see many surahs starting with these initial uh, letters, but no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their meanings. So you will not find any explanation regarding these. Some of the Islamic scholars have tried to decipher them and you know just try to understand them, what it may, they may mean or they may not mean, but there is no general consensus on them. So what we know so far is that the starting, okay. these starting letters they are the ones whose meaning is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, 
I guess the uh, meaning of sorry Yasin, the first letters, right? So Correct. one of the names of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Yasin. So in the starting even it says Yasin. Well, Quran Al Hakim. Yasin means uh, it can be. I'm not sure about it. It this can. This is what I'm saying. Yasin so is. Uh, yes, you are right. This is what I'm saying. Uh, basically, there is no consensus, and we don't find it in Sunnah or any explanation or a Hadith. Uh, where you know the meanings of these letters were interpreted. So, for, so far, what we know is that they, these are one of the miracles of Quran, and Allah Taala knows their meanings. And this is, by the way, the beauty of Quran as well. Uh, so, let's move forward. This is the book, the Quran, where there is no doubt. So, this is a book, a book without doubt. So, everything that is written in the Quran is truth and everybody agrees to it all muslims agree to it this is the guidance to those who are al muttaqin so you see the last word of this uh, ayah al muttaqin um, muttaqin are who the pious believers of islamic monotheism monotheism mean people who believe in one god one allah we believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone there is also polytheism where in some of the religions like let's say hinduism they believe in multiple gods so for us in islamic monotheism we believe in one allah he is rabbul alameen uh, as we also saw in surah fatiha so who are muttaqin the pious believers of islamic monotheism meaning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who fear allah much which means they abstain from all kinds of sins and evil deeds which he has forbidden so we fear allah that we don't want to do any act that he has asked us not to do and love Allah much perform all kind of good deeds which he has ordained so we try to perform the things and the acts that he wants us to do and in the following ayahs inshallah from three to five we will see what are those acts that he wants us to do so uh, and you also remember in the last uh, lesson we also learned one of the actions was that we should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the same concept is getting repeated in this ayah number two of this surah now when we look at the definition here there are two things that are mentioned for muttaqin love and fear so we should fear now there are i just want to explain i think we all know and we also talked about it in detail in the last session when we talked about um, we should love allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we had uh, we have a lot of reasons to thank him to praise him and to love him uh, because you know of everything that he has given us and we discussed about them but let's talk about fear fear can also be of two types one of the fears that you can have is if somebody is you know cruel to you or if he is not so uh, if he tries to impose something on you or something negative fear but what i want us to focus on today is the fear that you also have out of love because you know when you love someone, you don't want to offend them. You want to take care. So if you have a strong relationship with someone, if it's a friendship or someone and you like them really, you are afraid that you don't want to offend them because you don't want that relationship to be broken. So I want you to think of this relationship, inshallah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We fear so that, you know, we are not doing something that is wrong and, you know, we get the punishment for it. So we have to protect this our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and protect our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, later on in the slides or later on in this presentation, on this discussion, we will see how, what are the elements, what are the things that we can do uh, in order to be inshallah from within al muttaqin So let's move forward. The third ayah. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Who believe in the ghaib. Ghaib means the unseen. And we will get the explanation of ghaib uh, uh, later on, just in a few seconds. Who believe in the ghaib, meaning who believe in the unseen, and perform a salah, the prayers, what we call also namaz, the prayer that we do five times a day and spend out of what we have provided for them which is zakat so now we are we have started to come to the pillars of islam so they believe in the ghaib which is unseen um, unseen concepts they perform as salah and they spend out of what allah ta'ala has provided them which is the money 
or the things that Allah Ta'ala has given us, we give out zakat, obligatory charity, um, spend and how do you, uh, so, so you give out the zakat and also who spend on themselves, their parents, their children, their wives and also give charity to the poor in Allah's cause. Okay. So let's move forward uh, to the explanations. Al ghaib. Al ghaib literally means the things not seen, as I told you. But this word also includes vast meanings. The belief in Allah. Can you see the belief in Allah? If I ask you to believe in Allah, can we? Can we? Do we? Do we see Allah? No, we don't see Allah. But we see His signs. We see His ayahs. Uh, we see them all around us that we discussed in the last lesson as well. We have to. Uh, unseen means we have to believe in the angels. We have to believe in the holy books that came before Quran. Before Quran. Allah's messengers. Um, we have to believe in the day of judgment. We talked about Yawm al -Din in the last uh, lesson as well. So the day of judgment, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen it happening in front of us, but we still have to believe. We have to believe in Al-Qadr, which is the divine, uh, the, the, the future ordainments or Qadr, right? We have to believe in that, that yes, there is an element of our lives that is already pre-decided. It also includes... What Allah and His Messenger وسلم, informed about the knowledge of the matters of the past, the present, and even the futures. Uh, so news about the creation of the heavens and the earth, we haven't seen them. Botanical and zoological life, the news about the nations of the past and about paradise and hell. So it includes everything uh, that we may not have literally seen from our eyes. Right? So in the last lesson, we also learned that there are signs in this world that we can see, that we continue to explore. But there is, uh, there are a lot of things that we cannot see and we cannot look at from our eyes. It's a limitation of our eyesight, but still we believe because it's mentioned here in the Holy Quran as part of our belief or Iman. On Salah, the performance of Salah prayers means that each and every Muslim, male or female, is obliged to offer her prayer regularly five times a day. The men go to the mosques, the females pray them at home. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said, order your children to perform prayers at the age of seven and beat them at the age of 10. If they don't pray, then you know, the, the instruction to the parents is that you can even beat your children if they don't uh, pray. So, um, so we should, I mean, this is because of the obligation. And we'll talk about this later as well. The chief of a family and the Muslim rulers of the country, they also have to help people and they have to guide people to offer their salah. They have to create mosques and all of these things. Um, then the Holy Prophet وسلم, also said he used to offer them with all their rules and regulations. So basically in the Quran, in the Surah, we saw that who believe, who are the muttaqeen who believe in the Qaim and perform a salah. But we didn't get the method of the salah. We didn't get how to perform. How do we do sajda? How do we bend? How do we go up? Um, how do we prostrate? So all of these things sitting, the method was of Salah came to us from the Holy Prophet. I will talk about this a little bit in detail as well. The third thing mentioned in this ayah is the Zakah, the obligatory charity. So what we have to do is that every year, all Muslims have to check how much wealth or how much money they had throughout the year. And there is a part of this uh, part of this zakah that they have to give out to the poor and uh, this zakah is like used for the welfare of the people and everything okay so how nice three percent right yes go ahead yeah so we have to give three percent of all the wealth we have like after every year it's obligatory yes it's two and a half percent uh, it's calculated and some people, I mean, you can be safe and you can give more and anything, but the obligatory is two and a half percent and there is a method of calculating it and there are details here. I want you right now to remember the concept that we have to give out from what Allah has given us. So I think this is a very important point because we feel it is our money. So if I'm going to work and you know, I'm earning some money, I believe that this is my money or this is my house and this is, no, the concept here is if you read the ayah again, and they spend out of what we have provided for them. So even this money and whatever wealth or that we have, gold, everything that we have, Allah Ta'ala has provided us. And he's just asking us for a small amount to help the poor and the needy. 
you know so he has given us and then again he is so from that standpoint to start off with it's not we should not think of this as our ownership yes we have this we should use it uh, use it in the best of causes and here one of the obligatory things is the zakat uh, which we have to give out to the poor and help the poor now we move to ayah number 4 وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ And who believe in that the Quran and Sunnah. So still the explanation is going on. So if you, if you, if you remember from at the end of ayah number 2, we, we, we got the concept of Al-Muttaqeen, who are they? who fear allah who love allah and then who believe in ghaib or unseen who pray who give zakah who give zakat and now it's it, it's continuing and who believe in the quran and the sunnah which has been sent down revealed to you muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in that which was sent down before you which is the torah and the injil and the other books so we as muslims confirm those books and they believe with certainty in hereafter which is the day of judgment or yawm al-din that we talked about in the last class which in which they will get um, if they did good things it will be a good outcome inshallah which is janna or paradise and if they did uh, uh, bad then it can the outcome will not be good which is the hell so once you see the full explanation until ayah number 4 then ayah number 5 is telling us ulaika ala hudam mir rabbihim they are on true guidance from their lord or from their rab we saw that the rab is the right word in arabic and yes english translation is lord so they are the guidance from their lord and they are the ones who are successful so in surah fatiha we pray to allah taala to show us the right path in this surah at the start the first three four ayahs they are explaining to us briefly what is the right path and this is the start of the journey we have to read and understand the full quran because more explanations and more meanings will come out and more things uh, we will get to know that will help us to be successful what is the ultimate objective we have to be successful now there is a, a, a sahih bukhari hadith which says allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said islam is based on the following five principles i think you all know the five pillars of islam so the number one is belief in allah taala how do you declare your belief do you testify la ilaha illallah when uh, la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah muhammad rasulullah right So Allah Taala, we believe in only one God, one Rabb, which is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is His Rasul, is His Prophet. There is no one whom we worship other than Allah, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Messenger of Allah. This is number one pillar of Islam, which is our belief. Then number two is prayer, salah, to perform the five compulsory congregational salah prayers. Number three, zakat. Number four, Hajj. when we go to the house of allah pilgrimage to makka finally it is fasting during the month of ramadan um in the previous class uh, one of you one of the brothers also asked that um, why do we pray salah and you know we can get good deeds and hasana and uh, we can get sawab from other deeds as well so here is the answer allah subhanahu wa taala is telling us that there are five obligations and obligation means you cannot miss them so these are the mandatory so if you are a muslim you have to believe prayer all of these are five key obligations and pillars of islam and allah taala obligated these because he ha- he is the one who has created us right we learnt it in the previous lesson as well he is the rab he is the creator so the creator knows how will we operate he has our he if we, he knows he has our user manual how we can best operate and there are mandatory things that you need to do so if you have a device or a toy or something there are for example batteries that you need to use so this will be the instruction that you know you need batteries without that it won't operate so we need to think of these pillars as the obligations or mandatory without this you know we cannot uh, operate uh, as a muslim so this is the full explanation that is here then um the important thing to understand here is that 
the five pillars or let's say the salah and zakah zakat and all of this is mentioned here in the holy quran how do we get the details as we saw in the previous uh, hadith as well we get the details from sunnah from the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we cannot separate the two it has to be quran the instruction in the quran and then further explanation or details of how to perform salah how to give zakah what are the rules how to perform hajj um we find the details in sunnah so which is why both of these are very important and uh to understand these obligations and to perform them in the right way and to be successful because ayah number 5 is telling us they are on true guidance from their lord and they are the ones who are successful now now i'm opening up the session so actions for us right so far does anyone have any question on what we have discussed in the five ayahs before i go on to the other things okay so i'm assuming that this is very clear now i want to explain to you guys a very important concept and i want your full attention so i will do the check that we do are you guys with me alhamdulillah alhamdulillah okay a few voices some of them are still so if anybody is multitasking anybody is doing something else please come back and now focus with me because this is a very very important concept inshallah that i am about to share with you so in front of you you have five circles everybody can see the five circles the one the purple one is the core it's in the middle and then all the circles are almost around it so you know you can treat it as the root as the core is number 1 then you have number 2 which is an outer circle number 3 which is an outer circle number 4 and finally number 5 so these are the circles uh, uh, that i want to explain a concept to you guys with based on what we have discussed uh. the five pillars and the obligations of islam okay number 1 are the principles so what are the principles of islam these are the ultimate target that we have to achieve to be successful as muslims what do we mean by the ultimate target so how allah wants us to be as human beings we understand from these principles what should be our qualities what should be our emotions what should be our thoughts how do we really operate for success in this world inshallah as well as in the akhira or hereafter so these are the principles i am not talking about the obligations i am not talking about the pillars i am talking about the principles now for example what are the principles the principles of islam are or the target of everything that we do is and here i have highlighted some as an example one of the principle is remembrance of allah to remember allah to be grateful to allah to praise allah to thank allah to think and reflect so to think about certain things allah taala uh, asks us in the quran to think and reflect to see to protect ourselves from evil to have integrity to be honest to speak the truth have taqwa uh we saw who are muttaqin you know to fear and love of allah subhanahu wa taala to be patient when we are tested we have to be patient these are the qualities or the principles that allah taala wants us to have as the ultimate objective and target how do we find them or how do you know that these are the ultimate principles and objectives so we find them in the holy quran this entire journey inshallah the discussion series is about quran so quran mentions these when terms like this come so that laal lakum allah loves so that you are uh, so that you can gain taqwa so that you are muttaqin so that you think allah loves those who are muttaqin allah loves those who are patient and then finally allah is with ma the word ma in arabic so allah is with so you will find inshallah as we go through our journey during the holy quran these references that are mainly the ultimate objective or principles or fundamentals that we have in our religion that allah wants us to be as human beings okay 
Now, the question that comes to our mind, which is why this is the Q&A session, so I thought I'll pose the question myself. The question that comes to my mind is, these are ideas. How do we achieve them? So for example, is there a medicine that I take or a pill that I take to have taqwa? Is there a, is there a shopping mall where I can go and buy something, you know, to remember Allah more or what should we do? So how can we can get these principles in our life practically? What can we do practically? That's the question, right? Sorry, somebody wanted to speak something? Uh, yeah, uh, it's by practicing. Uh, taqwa is... And sir, can you tell me what's taqwa? Sorry, you want to understand taqwa? Yeah, so just uh, explain it. Sure. So taqwa, uh, as we saw the explanation of muttaqeen, taqwa, so muttaqeen are the people who have taqwa. So taqwa is, you fear Allah not to do something that he has asked us not to do. And at the same time, you love Allah. So the, it's a full explanation because in Arabic, there, the, there is depth in meanings of words. So it is fear and love together. And I explained earlier that, you know, if you have a relationship with someone and you really love them, then you fear that you don't want to break this relationship. You don't want to lose them. So this is the relationship that we need to have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is based on taqwa. Fear that we don't offend or do anything uh, that is against his uh, guidance and love to praise him, to thank him and to do everything that he has asked us, including the obligation, the five pillars and everything. So this is taqwa. Now you can ask me, okay, so I understand the concept of taqwa. It is fear Allah and it is to love Allah Ta'ala. But how do I increase my love to Allah Ta'ala? So sir, you asked us. Yeah, I, exactly. I right. So this is the question. So let's try yeah. to answer this question. No, no. It's my answer. I'm going to answer it. I, I do have an answer. Sure, sure. Go ahead. So we can do that by... Yeah, you can do it by practicing it. Uh, practicing means like uh, we should. Sorry, your voice was do great. That, Allah yeah. forbidden. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So I think you have already taken me so my should... next circle. Your answer is correct. Thank you so much, because you're right. We should do what Allah Taala has told us and not do what Allah Taala has stopped us. So let's move to the next circle now. Number one principles is our target, what we want to do, what we want to achieve. And this is not something that we are saying, it's coming out of Quran. So Allah Ta'ala wants us to do this. And this is what we have uh, uh, interpreted. And it will come throughout the Quran, inshallah, as we continue our understanding journey. Number two is, as you rightly said, obligations and prohibitions. What does this mean? These are no misactions that we have to do or we don't have to do so they are both included in this actions that we must do and also we should know actions that we do not do to reinforce these principles because as you rightly said we took one example of taqwa it can be anything remembrance so what is the action that we do so these obligations and prohibitions so within these obligations there can be five pillars that we just saw within five pillars we saw salah prayer which Allah Ta'ala says it helps us to remember him. It is prayer is to remember me, right? Which is why we said Allah Ta'ala has made it obligatory. It, it, it helps us form a strong connection and remember Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala because we do it five times a day. Um, when you do something repeatedly, we as humans, we will continue to remember him, right? So which is why this discipline is needed when we are performing Salah and which is why it is an obligation because Allah Ta'ala knows He has created us, He is our creator that human beings need these reminders. All of us need reminders in life, right? So from that aspect, um, prayer is a reminder for us to remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Similarly, fasting is for Taqwa. So these are the obligations that will help us to achieve those ideas that are our ultimate objective that we must do as Muslims. You know, we should have taqwa, we should remember Allah, we should thank Allah, um, all of these things. So these are the obligations and prohibitions. Similarly, there are prohibitions. So we know straight away there are things that are haram, like, you know, eating pork or alcohol or zina and all of these things. So they are stated very clearly. What we need to understand is these obligations and prohibitions 
should reinforce our principles. The principles that we saw in circle number one are the core of our religion, which we want to achieve. So basically, in prayer, we have to be conscious during Salah, we have to be conscious that we are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are remembering him and we will do what is right, we will do what is not, what is wrong. So, so these things, obligations and prohibitions cannot be disjoined from principles. What happens is the mistake that we do is we focus too much on obligations and we forget about the principles. This is not what we have to do. We have to always eat. So for example, I can give you an example of fasting. So we are fasting, we are not eating, we are not drinking, we are not doing anything. However, what if we continue to lie? What if we continue to do other bad stuff? What if we continue while, while fasting? So which, because what will happen is, if we do other bad stuff, let's say if we lie, it is against integrity. It is against being a Muslim, being an honest Muslim. So what you are doing is, although you have performed the obligation of fasting, but you have missed the principle, which is why we have to first understand the principles and then there should be a strong connection to every obligation that we are doing and every prohibition that we are not doing. Everything should be linked to those principles to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can be successful. Where do we get this guidance? We get this guidance from Quran, the Holy Quran and Sunnah of the Holy Prophet, which explains that Quran. So Quran has obligation of Salah, but the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet وسلم, will explain us how to perform that Salah, which is why I said both of these are very important. So here I have just mentioned a few examples, but inshallah, as we proceed in our understanding of the Quran, we will see what are these obligations and these provisions and everything. But you have to remember that there has to be a strong connection to the principles or the core objective of everything that you are doing, uh, every act that you're doing uh, as an obligation, or if you are not doing something as a prohibition that Allah Ta'ala has stopped us from, it is linked to the core principle. You have to be conscious of that. Moving forward. Yes, please go ahead. Sir, what is Zina? Zina is basically Allah Ta'ala has told us a way of relationship between males and females, right? And that relationship is that you get married and you get into a nikah. This is a blessed relationship. However, if you do something that is out of this relationship or you don't have it, then between a mahram or a non-mahram, male or a female, this is what Zina is. We will get into the details of, his, uh, of this as we get into uh, uh, into the later part of the Quran and as we understand uh, Quran further there are uh, uh, there are specific details to it what it is and what are they but for you right now to understand it is if you don't have uh, uh, the right relationship if you are not in nikah with between a mahram and a non mahram male female then this is called jina and then the explanation will come in okay good so um, when we are performing obligations and prohibitions Last point is we should always remind ourselves about the target or the principles that is related to it. So Salah is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're standing. It's not just an exercise that you do, okay, Allah Akbar, and then you go down and then you know you're done and then you just, no, 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 wait, <laughs> pause, relax, and just feel that you know you're about to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's the most powerful um, and you know, and he, he alone can solve all your problems. I gave you examples last time, some from my own life as well. So when you pause and think, uh, then you will be able to connect with the principle that you are trying to do in every obligation, inshallah, that you are doing that Allah Ta'ala has asked us to do. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, last point here is that how to perform these obligations and pillars, we find details in the Sunnah, which is why Quran and Sunnah both go together to understand uh, how we can do it because it's like you know you have a box of you get a box of a new gadget or uh, uh, something and there are some basic things like how to install and all of this that are on the box on the top of it but there are details in the user manual you have a long user manual on how to do it and how to clean it and all, all of those things and actually how to do it so you can understand it similarly so you have the instructions there but the explanations and detailed things are explained to us in the sunnah now we have covered two circles. The third circle are called enhancements. 
So what are these enhancements? Enhancements are basically you decorate, uh, right? Stuff. So this is called an enhancement. Recommendations and good deeds to further enhance our principles. And the main source of these recommendations or good deeds come from where? Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what are the examples of these enhancements that we have? For example, walking with humility, lowering your voice, dua to enter and leave home, the zikr that we do after salah or prayer. There are many things that come again we see from sunnah. So all of these things are the decoration or beautification of our means. So once you understand the principles and then you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the obligation, and then you perform all these obligations, the third thing to do as Muslim is to en enhance our religion, which further strengthens our principles uh, that we discussed in the first part, right? So these are also very important, and we should continuously add these enhancements in our lives. Every day we should try to learn one small dua, one small dhikr, uh, one small thing that we add after Salah um, that, is, uh, that is explained to us by the Holy Prophet. So, so, so you now understand the flow. The number one was principles. Then it was obligation and prohibitions. And number three is enhancements. Now let's pause here for a second. We have one, two and three. Let me explain these three to you with a different example. Let's say you are building a house. You are building a house. What is the objective of building this house? The principle, the objective of building this house is it should protect me from sunlight or extreme weather, from rain, from snow, from sunlight, whatever. And this house should protect me. It should give me some privacy. People should not be, you know, just walking by and imagine you don't have walls and people are looking at you, right? So you need that privacy in your house. So there are certain principles to build a house, right? And there are some so to, to achieve uh, those principles, you have some obligations and prohibitions. So you have something that are must do. You definitely need walls, right? In a house, you need walls or something that covers, that provides that principle that, you know, I need privacy. So you need walls. The second thing is the important thing is I need to enter. So it should have doors. It should have windows. There are these basic things that are needed to build the house. The third thing is our enhancements. You can get a nice carpet. You can get a nice sofa where, you know, you can relax and you can sit back and you can get other things that are enhancements. However, um, let's say, um, now let's come between the connection between the principles and obligation. Let's say you hired an architect and you told him, listen, my principle is I want to, uh, I want to have privacy and I want to protect myself from harsh weather. Okay. Please build me four walls and create a house for me and give me some windows and all of this. Now, what if the builder builds the house, he gives you the four walls and there are gaps in between the walls. So he took your instruction or obligation of having four walls, but he did not join them. He left space and then he's fighting with you. No, no, but I built the walls, right? There is a gap, but it's fine. I mean, you don't tell you didn't tell me to fill the gap. I mean, I built the walls. I've done the obligation. I have four walls. You told me it's in the paper, isn't it? It's in the agreement. So what we need to understand is there has to be a connection between the obligation that, okay, you have to build the four walls and principle. I want privacy. I don't want sunlight. I don't want, uh, uh, I don't want uh, snow to, to get in or even like cats or lizards or whatever. I don't want them to be in. This is the principle. So the person did the obligation without keeping the principle in mind, which is why when we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or when we perform any obligation, or when we refrain from anything that he has asked us not to do, we should understand the principle and keep that as the core and try to achieve that principle. What is Allah asking us when we are praying? What is he asking us to do? He's asking, her, asking us to remember him, right? So if he's asking us to remember him, it cannot be a simple exercise. I cannot just go da, 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 down and, you know, left, right, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and then I'm done. No, it doesn't work this way. We have to think, we have to pause, we have to feel that we are in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So which is why? Linking to the principle of these obligations and these prohibitions is very, very important. The third thing, example of the house, enhancements. Yes, should we have a sofa? Should we have a nice bed? Should we have uh, all other things? We have a nice carpet. These things are good for comfort. 
and they enhance and some of them can even in, enhance your principle so you can have a door an enhancement can be that you put a one lock and you put second lock and third lock so this will enhance the principle of security in your house right so enhancements and obligations are have direct connection to the principles of our religion which is the ultimate objective and target amazing thing is that all of the scholars and everyone has complete alignment on these three circles so there are no differences uh, of opinion from the islamic scholars or anyone on the principles obligations prohibitions and enhancements so all of these things that come from quran and sunnah alhamdulillah there are no direct disagreements now what are circle number 4 and 5 i will just mention them to you however right now i will not go into the details of them okay because i believe for us right now the first three these circles are the most important ones but just to let you know the complete thinking about uh, how we should go about learning and understanding the the our religion there is number 4 and number 5 as well so this is number 4 is ijma sahaba this means that after the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away there were some let's say problems when which arose in the islamic state and then sahaba had to collectively collectively come and 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 pass some judgments or rulings there are three times one is based on events so ijma of sahaba based on events so for example there were sahaba who were in uh, ghazwa e badr or uh, and they were recalling the events what happened what happened so this is based on event and then the second one is uh, regarding the, the the islamic scholars so the fuqaha the the guys who were uh, in depth in religion they did uh, ijma and they, if there were anything that they could not find in the quran and the sunna and they had to pass something a rule a ruling or a problem they had to solve then they uh, uh, pass those uh, judgments and rules so those are based on uh, scholars and finally there were some which were based on governors in terms of governing the country and if they could not find the guidance from quran and sunnah they used to do it so there were three types of ijma between sahaba uh, that we find as well and finally the top level is ijtihad uh, or the fatwas which any islamic scholar can look at a problem and if he doesn't find the solution in quran and sunnah um and then in ijma of sahaba after doing a lot of research then he can come up with a fatwa which the way he should say it is he should not say that okay this is my fatwa other than this it is not islam and you know this is islam and all of this no the way he should say it is that this is my fatwa this is my best understanding of this problem that's how i will go about it and then if people want to follow him they can follow him so just as a concept i wanted to explain to you guys in terms of sources of knowledge that we have our principles that we derive from the holy quran we have obligations and prohibitions that come from the quran and the sunna and then we have the enhancements the recommendations the small deeds the azkar and all of these things that we need to do in order to enhance our principles and enhance our overall deen and then the fourth requires a lot of research and the fifth requires even more and you know uh, from that standpoint I saw a hand raised, uh, Shayan. Uh, do you have any question? I was asking I that um, when you talk about principles, obligations, and prohibitions and enhancements, they are ways to basically promote the way you increase taqwa with Allah. But once you go to ijma and ijtihad, they are ways to again information about a certain problem that has not been discovered so i wanted to ask how are they related the fourth and fifth circle to the first three circles because so, from what i know ijma is uh, when multiple muslims gather together to identify a solution for new coming problems that were not available during the holy prophet's time i will explain it to you i think it's a very good question shayan thank you for asking and it's a it's a little bit uh, i mean it's a new concept for us to understand so let's spend some a little bit more time on this one so thank you so much for asking this question now the principles are it's not just taqwa but they are many so it's also remembrance of allah subhanahu wa taala having the integrity and we will get them more so today we uh, we learned about al muttaqin those uh, uh, about taqwa and all and then uh we will learn more about 
uh, other principles as they come as we go through and we progress in the holy quran inshallah so these principles we derive from the quran because we are saying ultimate success is um, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should guide us from the right path we saw today that the right path the answer starts with surah al baqarah and then it unfolds into the entire holy quran so we will continue to unfold these principles as well as obligations and prohibitions now obligations and prohibitions we know that some of them are mentioned in the quran but we get the explanation from sunnah so quran and sunnah becomes very important enhancements are the recommendations or small deeds um, that we get again from sunnah on how we can enhance our religion further so these three here principles obligation and prohibitions and enhancements all three are closely related to knowledge that is coming from quran and sunnah and hadith of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ijma and ijtihad so you said something that i just want to correct it, the the when you are faced with a new problem that is not in the quran and sunnah it's not called ijma it's called ijtihad ijma is mainly of the sahaba so ijma sahaba that it is called um this is where at the time of the sahaba after the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when they faced a problem and they could not find um, uh, when they could not find it in quran and sunnah that's where uh, they they all sat together especially the islamic scholars one as well as the last one that i told, talked about the governance one they sat together and they tried to find the best uh, solution via consensus or agreement amongst themselves and obviously there was third type of ijma which was event which was just when they all of them then a few of them who attended that event they recalled right so that's the third type ijtihad is valid for today's islamic scholars as well so after that period that has passed and here where you know where if if new problems come up then someone needs or someone islamic scholar can so the the thinking process that starts from him and this is where the connection comes i think your your question was also on the connection of all these so he will look at quran for that problem then he will look at sunnah then he will also look at ijma sahaba to see how sahaba ikram uh, uh, did and react to that problem if he cannot find it in all of these four then based on his best knowledge all the research that he does he will say this is a fatwa or this is something that i think is right from my standpoint and then the people have the option to follow him or the, or not so those people who who are aligned with the thinking and who say yes this this is something that we that we agree with as well so they can follow him but those are not binding on we cannot say that this is islam and this is not islam i hope i have clarified the the flow of uh, the knowledge and you know how it is all connected yes okay jazakallah wa iyyak so any other questions on this this is the last uh, yeah last part of this now i am moving to the core of the actions uh, number one is always remember and understand the core principles we have to understand the core principles again that will come out of quran inshallah so as we will build our understanding of the quran every surah every aya as we proceed inshallah we will pray to allah taala to give us the understanding of these core principles some of them very few of them we we also touched here okay uh, in this lesson so we have to remember them then we have to act upon obligations and stay away from prohibitions to reinforce these principles in this statement number 2 the last part to reinforce the principles is very important i gave you the example of the house that someone can build four walls but they can forget the principle that you know they don't join them and you know there's no point because they have forgotten the principle that it had to be it had to give me privacy similarly we can pray salah very quickly and all and if we don't understand that it is for the remembrance of allah and if you are not conscious uh, then you know then we are not linking it to the core or uh, if we are doing uh, if you are if you are not eating and not drinking during fasting but then we are doing other stuff uh, which is going against the core one of the core principles then uh, you know we are defying the principle and then the way allah taala defines uh, allah subhanahu wa taala defines success in the holy quran is by mentioning these principles or these qualities that he wants us as muslims to achieve one of the action that can start for all of us is obviously there are the five pillars five obligations that we learned about today however we can start off by saying today that this is one of the action one of the brothers asked me at the start 
that you know will we have an assignment in this class i think if you ask me then this is the first assignment because all of you have crossed the age of 7 and the age of uh, 10 i am assuming or some of them some of you are almost reaching 10 right so so from that standpoint start with your prayers try to understand ask your parents how can you pray ask uh, 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 someone a religious scholar or these days in the internet you can find some authentic resources but try to find an authentic resource to learn the prayer if you don't know and if you know then try to build this connection that it is for the remembrance of allah it is to have taqwa five times which is why you know it has been obligated upon us so this is one of the action that i want to give you guys today start with five times prayer because this is one of the obligation inshallah this obligation when you will keep the principle in mind will lead you to success as we saw in this uh, class today right the last action that i wanted to mention with you guys is that yes we have to focus on obligations we have to stop from things that we don't allah taala has to ask us not to do which is the prohibitions but the third thing is also to enhance ourselves try to enhance being a muslim try to follow and for first understand these small recommendations and good deeds that we learned from sunnah try to uh, learn and memorize um, small duas uh, that you can bring to your life for in baraka inshallah and again these enhancements inshallah will also contribute towards um, the core principles that are must needed so the number one point is the core principle for us muslims because this is how allah taala defined success and said that you know this is the ultimate objective or the principle or the fundamental um of our religion so this is it from my side um like every lesson we 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 try to end it with a dua and a prayer that may allah subhanahu wa taala open our hearts and minds to feel the miracles of quran in our lives ameen ya rabbal alamin um is there any other question before we close this session Are you all with me? Yes, yes sir. Alhamdulillah. Is there any question? Alhamdulillah. Uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, I had a question related to uh, some, uh, like uh, financial, related to like uh, earning and all. If you have any idea related to it, please. Sorry, uh, the question is regarding some, uh, financially earning. Can you repeat the last part, please? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, thinking of earning online. So for that, I had earned fifty dollars online. So I was thinking, if you have any idea, how can I earn online if I try? Online, uh, there are multiple avenues uh, that you can earn. It also it it depends on what your capabilities are, right? So, uh, what you know, I think. um what i can tell you at least related to this class is there is, we have a conscience right so we know from the inner our heart that you know there are some things that are right there are some things that are wrong just try to apply the principles of islam and always do the right thing because online you can earn from uh, different avenues and i'm not sure about your background about your studies what your passion is um so i cannot really guide you directly but what i can do is if you want we can separately connect um and i can one principle or, or one thing that i can tell you at least from what i have seen um especially in my uh, corporate life or you know when i work in, in my work life i've now been working for almost um, 13 14 years and before that as well i was also um, doing some online work and i was also giving tuitions so there are lots of avenues now um especially with this zoom and online that you can do but one of the principles is and this 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 principle can also help you in you know uh, when you when you become older and when you complete your studies inshallah when you do your bachelor's or masters and then when you enter into the job field i think it's very important to know that you should try to uh, first thing is try to learn a skill set that becomes that is unique to you so it makes you valuable try to learn something that you are an expert of focus on one thing because then if you are an expert of this then you can do uh, amazing things with it right and in order to become an expert of something and if you want to pursue this one thing throughout your life um one important thing is to have a passion for it so you should enjoy doing it so you should try to do something that you really enjoy and have a passion for because 
more likely, I mean, you know, you will end up doing it for the rest of your life. So, for example, let's take up a field. You can do something in accounting, you can do something in IT or medical or something else. So, choose the field that really, you know, you, um, you are passionate and excited about. Because most probably, even if you do your, let's say, own business or if you do a job or something, you will end up doing it for many years uh, in the future. And I've seen people mainly, uh, generally, I mean, success obviously is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we saw. Uh, here as well but even in this life as well um, uh, Allah Ta'ala obviously is the provider of risk uh, however he has also asked us to to do to, 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 to do our effort our best effort right so we have to put in that effort and I've seen people being successful where they put their effort on their passion area so what they really enjoy doing so at this point in time, at your age, uh, in teenage years, you guys should try to find out what you really enjoy doing and then try to link it to one of the skill sets uh, that you want to acquire. And that skill will become your mastery, inshallah. And when you go forward, when you grow up, uh, you will enjoy your bachelor's, you will enjoy your master's, you will even enjoy the interviews that you will give uh, when you go for jobs and you will tell them, listen, this is what I've already done. Um, and I'm an expert of this. I've done one, two, three, four projects or I've done these internships. So all of this can really help you. But try to uh, get that core skill or something that you're really, really passionate about. I know it is a very generic answer that I've just given you. It's not specific. But if you want, then, you know, we can uh, connect separately, inshallah, as well. But I had to keep it generic uh, for the majority of you. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, nothing. We have a question. Shayan, I heard you are raising your hand. hand. Shayan Vaseem, yes. Um, sir, I also wanted to ask that um, because we just talked about uh, the beliefs in the unseen, which I believe predestination is a big part of. So I wanted to ask that uh, in predestination, it's a really hard concept to grasp. But basically in it is that uh, if you uh, you have a choice, but then Allah knows what will happen. So do you actually have a choice or not? Very good. I think this is one of the topics um, that requires a lot of uh, depth. Uh, and we have been asked to stay away from it in the hadith as well. But just to answer you simply, and this is also supported by hadith of the Holy Prophet, just to explain it simply to you. Allah Ta'ala will make it easy for us what we pursue. So if we pursue the right things, inshallah, he will make it easy for us and ordain it for us to follow that right path. And if we pursue the wrong, then it will may, he will make it or he will, he, we will move towards that path. But, and there are elements within the topic of Qadr or predestination, some things that we have control of, some things that we don't have control of. But yes, it's a complicated topic. Inshallah, when it comes, I will try to um, share with you guys the understanding and meanings uh, based on uh, what we get from the Quran and most importantly also from the explanations from the Hadith and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. There are some very nice explanations to clarify this concept as well. Inshallah, I'll be sharing them. But for right now, we need to understand that it's not like, okay, everything is predestined, so I should not do anything. I should just, you know, I mean, I... Uh, I have nothing in my control. No, Allah Ta'ala. And, and one thing that we need to understand also is that Allah Ta'ala is beyond what we think in terms of his power and in terms of, so there are things, limitations in this world like time uh, and, you know, space and all of this where we live in, in this world. But this is, uh, these are also his creations. Allah Ta'ala, uh, even time is Allah Ta'ala's creation. So for him, to know the future while, you know, we have, we have some control of the future. It's not impossible. So inshallah, we will go through this topic. I know it's a difficult topic. And to be honest with you, we have been asked to stay away from a topic that can misguide uh, people, but uh, we will see and we will explore it as and when it comes inshallah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan uh, for attending this class. Uh, inshallah, we will be connecting for the next lesson next week, same time on Saturday. Um, I'll be looking forward to see you all, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.